Hi, welcome to this ultimate video guide on how to build a resource management application with Caspio Secure, an easy to use online database platform. My name is Ned and in part two of this video guide, I will show you how to begin building an app in Caspio, how to set up all the database tables, and how to relate your tables using primary and foreign keys. Let's dive in. When you log into your Caspio account, you're always taken to the home screen where you see the list of all of your applications. And to begin building your very first application in Caspio, all you need to do is click on this link new app. That's going to launch this window. And from here, you can build your applications by importing data, or you can begin building your applications as a blank template. Now, I already have my application created, so go ahead on your end, click on this button, give your application a name. You can call it whatever you want. In this use case, we're building an IT resource management application, so ideally, you want to have the same naming convention. Once you're done, click on Finish, and you should now be able to see that application listed on your home page. From here, all you need to do is click Open. And once you open up the application, you're going to be taken to the Overview screen. And the Overview screen is mostly informational for you to keep track of your progress as you're building your applications inside Caspio. Once you're done with the overview screen, the most important place where you want to begin is going to be the tables object. Tables are the foundation of any app that you develop inside Caspio. So it's critical to have the tables built initially in order to have the right structure and also the right schema, which will serve as a blueprint for later on when you're building your forms and reports. Now to speed things up in this video guide, I have already built all of my tables but I will show you all the field names of each table. This way you can pause the video and then copy the same fields inside your tables as well. Now the main table that I want you to start off with is the employees table. To build your table, all you need to do is click on this link here, new table. And once you do that, you're gonna be able to see a window that looks like this. Now you're gonna have zero fields inside your table. At this point, what I want you to do is just go ahead and pause the video and copy the fields that I have on my screen along with the appropriate data type and also flag all the fields that are meant to be unique. The fields that this table will need is the employee ID. This is going to be the primary key for this table to identify each employee with a unique ID. You can see how Caspi immediately flagged it as a unique field. You also have other options here so you don't have to use auto number. You can also use GUID or random ID if you wish. Then you have your first name, last name, and a full name. For full name, I'm using a formula data type. Once you select the formula data type, over here to the right, click on the edit link, and you're gonna get this pop-up window, and all you need to do is insert the first name side by side next to the last name, and then in between the two fields, you want to input some syntax here to create a space in between the first and last name. You can also verify your formula. Once you're done, click on apply. Then we have email, which I also tagged as a unique field because you're never going to have two different employees with the same email. Email is always unique to each employee. We have our password field, title of each employee, department they belong to, and locations. Now in this use case, I'm going to be using different locations. Perhaps your organization has employees across their different regions, so you may want to flag those as different locations. Access level to identify who's gonna have what privileges and user permissions. Manager ID, so that we can track and know which employees report to which manager. Account status is a checkbox, yes or no, which basically allows a higher level user to activate or deactivate certain employees if they no longer want them to log in. And then we have date created, which is a timestamp. And we also have date updated, which is also a timestamp, but make sure that you also hear on the right stamp on update and stamp on insert for date created. Once you're done, save your table, reopen that table and under data sheet tab, I want you to input a few employees inside your table. Notice that every single one of my employees in this table has a unique ID. The full name is concatenated thanks to the formula data type. Each email is unique. All the passwords are encrypted. We know their titles, departments, what location they're in, Access level, you can see we have employees, we have admins, managers, employees, etc. And thanks to this manager ID field, we know who reports to who. In other words, notice that Susan Smith, she happens to be the CEO of this company, and her ID is number one. Karen Riley and Jason Barnes, 
both report to Susan Smith, so what we do is we take Susan's ID and we stamp it inside these two data cells. This way we know that Karen and Jason report to Susan. Later on, I have other employees here, for example, VP of Sales also reports to Susan Smith. And down here below, we have Adele, who is a technical writer, also reports to Susan Smith. Now, I did this manually inside a table, but you can later on build a submission form to accomplish the same thing. Once you're done with this table, go back out to the Tables menu. And now I want you to create the inventory table. So I'm going to click on Design. At this point, go ahead and pause the video and copy all the fields that you see in my table inside your account as well. Now, if you're not tracking all of these different assets, for example, CPU, RAM, depending on what type of inventory your company manages, you don't need to include all of these fields. Just include relevant fields that pertain to your organization and the types of items that you wish to track. So each item will be identified using a random ID. Assigned to ID, we want to know what items are assigned to what employee. So you want to use an integer data type in order to properly stamp the auto number from the parent table inside this child table. Created by ID, so when an item is shipped and gets delivered to the office, we want to know which manager is submitting this item into the database. And last updated by ID, I would like to know which employee last updated this item. So if you make an update on a specific asset, you want to be able to stamp the ID whoever is making that update. The rest of the fields should be self-explanatory, so we're not going to spend too much time on that. Once you're done, go ahead and save your table, give it a name, and you should now be able to see two tables listed in this menu. The next thing I want you to do is create the inventory history log table. However, you don't have to build this table from scratch. All you really need to do is take the inventory table, create a duplicate, and once you create that duplicate, give it a name, go into the design tab, Pause the video now and just copy all the changes that you see in my screen inside your account as well. You'll notice that we don't have a unique field and I also changed the data type to text 255. Back out to the tables menu. The remaining tables are going to be simple lookup tables. So they're not going to be very robust in terms of fields and you don't have to worry about primary and foreign keys. So let's take a look at each table one at a time. This is a device lookup table. Again, click New. I'm going to click on Design and show you that this table only has one field. But then in the Data Sheet tab, these are all the devices that I'm tracking. You don't have to add all of these devices. Just go ahead and input a few if you want. And when you're done, go back out to the Tables menu and you should now be able to see four tables. Then we have a table for location. Again, if you're not tracking by location, you don't really have a need for the field location in your inventory table and you don't have a need for a lookup table of locations. I'm going to click on open and show you that we have four different locations. So if you want to copy the exact use case that you see in the video, go ahead and build this table, add your field, and input all these data values. Two more tables, one for status. Let's open it. My field name is status, and these are all the different statuses that we're tracking across all the inventory. So for example, if we purchase a new inventory item, I want to flag that one as in transit. If the item is defective, we can change the status to that. If the item is available to be used for another employee, we can flag that item as available. And the very last table that I want you to create is a very simple access level table. Also has one field of access level, and these are all the different access levels that our application is going to have. So an employee can be an admin, manager, or employee. Once you're done, you should be able to see all seven tables listed on the menu. The next thing that I want you to do is create a trigger. And all the trigger is going to do is when you insert something in the inventory table or make an update, I want that insert and that update to always be logged inside the log table. This way we have a historical trail and we know what happened for that specific item at any given point. So under the inventory table, click on more and then click on triggered actions. I already have it created. I'm just going to click on edit to show you my trigger. And this is what you have to recreate. You can pause the video now. The first thing you're going to do is insert an action called insert into. And when you do that in this drop down, go ahead and check for insert and update, which basically means you want to insert and also update the inventory history log table 
from the inserted table. And the inserted table is referring to this table up here, which is the inventory table. So let me explain this a little bit. It helps if you work backwards. When you add something to the inventory table, which is the inserted table, I want to insert and update the log table. And then what you have to do is map the fields from both of these two tables. Basically, all the fields that you wish to track, just go ahead and copy those fields. If you need to insert an additional field element, you can go to data and just drag over the field element and connect it over here to your other field. We don't have a need for that, so I'm just going to delete that. Once you're done, go ahead and save and enable your trigger and give it a name. And you can even test this at this point. Let's save it. If you open up your inventory table, it should be empty. There's no data inside this table now. But if you add something to this table really quickly, and you go into your inventory table of history log, you should be able to find that as well. Assuming, of course, you built the trigger correctly. The last thing in this video that we're going to talk about are the relationships. So click on this link. I already have my relationships created between my three tables. Go ahead and include those three tables, which are the employee table, the inventory, and the inventory history log table. I have my employee table to the left, my inventory table in the middle, and my log table, let me expand that a little bit, over here to the right. Basically what we're doing here is we're stamping the employee ID into the assigned to ID because we want to know which employee has been assigned a specific inventory item. I also want to track who created this item, so I want to stamp the employee's ID in this table as well. And I also want to know who was the last person to update the item, so once again we're going to be stamping the employee ID inside the inventory table. Now move over the same line into the log table just like you did in the inventory table and you'll be done with setting up all the relationships between your parent and child tables for this use case. I hope that you enjoy part two of this video guide. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video where I teach you how to set up all of the views to filter out users based on their permissions and how to create the login interface so once users log in they're going to be redirected to their own portal to view their own information. Thanks for watching and I'll see you there.